Okay, so you remember that we're talking through Midgley's essay, Trying Out One's New Sword. And uh, I just want to make a um, few more points about the essay, point to a few more things in it, and then raise the question of whether we agree or disagree with Midgley. Remember that Midgley's target here is the position that she calls moral isolationism. This is the position that holds that we can never legitimately make judgments about any culture other than our own or about practices in any culture other than our own. The reason that's given in moral isolationism is that we can never understand those cultures well enough to pass judgment. And in addition to the uh, four questions that we went through in the previous set of slides, uh, Midgley makes a few other arguments against moral isolationism that I want to highlight here. So one is an additional argument about judgment. She points out that one of the reasons we might be attracted to moral isolationism is that it seems to be the antithesis of something that we consider very bad. Uh, the thing we consider very bad is um, passing judgment on other cultures, even uh, despising them or oppressing them or steamrolling them, as she says, like going in and trying to change uh, cultures with military force and things like that. So we consider those things very bad. And uh, it might seem like if we consider them bad, then the only a uh, way to prevent them or the best way to prevent them or the best way to not do those things is to be moral isolationists and to say, look, uh, anything anybody does in a culture other than my own, I can't possibly have a negative opinion about. I just have to let them do what they do. The problem with that is that it actually leads to the inability even to condemn the opposite of moral isolationism. In other words, it leads to the inability to condemn despising, oppressing, or steamrolling other cultures. Because if someone from another culture says, well, yeah, we, um, sure, we, we enslave this entire other culture over here, but we are, are, we are, we are a different culture from you, and so you can't possibly condemn our enslaving of this other people, for instance, okay? That would be crazy, right? It would mean that we couldn't criticize um, very oppressive governments that um, do terrible things to their people. You can think about, for instance, Nazism in the 20th century, or you can think about slavery in the American South we wouldn't be able to pass judgment because those people are in a culture other than our own, 19th century America in the South or, um, or Germany in the, in the mid 20th century. And that just seems wrong. Uh, if, if it's wrong to despise, oppress, or steamroll other cultures, then it must be wrong all the time. It must be wrong wherever it happens, even if it happens in cultures other than our own. So the point there is that Moral isolationism, weirdly, seems to contradict itself. It gets in the way of our ability to condemn the thing that we want to uh, condemn or avoid by adopting it. Another problem that Midgley points out is that moral isolationism seems to depend on an overly simplistic view of culture itself. If you think about what moral isolationism is saying, it, it is assuming that there are these barriers between cultures so that a person who is in one is not in another and that there are these barriers that keep people from being in, you know, they can be in one but not in the other. There have to be these barriers blocking them off. But if you ask, what is it that makes a person part of a culture? How much is required in order to count as part of a culture? Um, it's hard to say. Take, for instance, a um, second generation uh, immigrant to the United States, like say from, from Eastern Europe, okay, from Czechoslovakia, uh, the Czech Republic these days, okay? So is that second generation person, are they a Czech person? Are they an American person? Are they part of American culture? Are they partly part of Czech culture and partly part of American culture? Um, and the same questions could be asked about all kinds of things. Somebody who is both a, uh, let's say, a 
um, a doctor and also a musician. They are, they, they're part of medical culture, but they're also part of musician culture. Let's say they're a jazz musician, but they're not a rock musician. So are they, are they part of musician culture in general or just part of jazz culture and not part of rock culture? Okay. Uh, these are difficult questions to answer. You might think about us as, as kind of each one of us as part of multiple overlapping cultures, but the extent to which we're a part of one or another is kind of fluid. And so, um, and, and it's also the case that cultures are, have influences on each other so that one culture will borrow practices from another culture. Does that mean that those practices are now the second culture's practice as well, or do they remain the first culture's practice, even though they were borrowed and taken up by the second culture? Okay, so you can think about chopsticks used in America, for instance. Are chopsticks now part of American culture, or are they not part of American culture because they were originally from East Asia? So the my point is not to try to settle these questions, or even to say that there's no way of thinking about them that's reasonable. There probably is a way of thinking about them that's reasonable, but it's rather just to say that moral isolationism rests a lot on the idea of a firm boundary between cultures where individuals are a part of one but not a part of another. And that seems a bit oversimplified and like it's gonna to lead to problems in applying the theory. So here's an example of where it would lead to a problem in applying the theory. Imagine that a second generation uh, Iranian American, okay, someone who's born in the US but whose parents emigrated to the US from Iran, wants to criticize the Iranian government and practices within uh, contemporary Iranian culture, okay? Is that a legitimate thing for them to do or do they not have a legitimate say about Iranian uh, politics and Iranian culture because they're an American rather than an Iranian? Well, are they partly an Iranian and partly an American? So the point there is that it, it's kind of focusing on the wrong things. What should be focused on is not whether this person belongs in the culture or not. What should be focused on is what is the actual substance of their criticisms? What do they have to say about the Iranian practices? What are their judgments about those practices? And are those judgments reasonable ones? Are they informed? Does the person understand the practices that they're criticizing well enough to be able to pass a reasonable or an informed judgment about them? And finally, um, Midgley presents this possible reply from a defender of moral isolationism. So she notes that probably if she was in discussion with someone about the sujigiri, the practice of trying out one sword on a chance wayfarer, that if she criticized the practice, if she said, uh, you know, I think that the sujigiri is actually was kind of a bad uh, practice. I mean, it, it, it treated individual human lives as just means to testing a sword and it, it ended those people's lives and hurt their families. And it wasn't, it, there probably was a better way to test the sword. It would have been better to test the sword in a different way that didn't cost an individual innocent human life. So she says, if she were to criticize the practice like that, then someone who defends the practice is probably not going to say, uh, well, you just don't understand it because you're not from the culture and that's the end of the conversation. You have no way or right to pass judgment on it at all. Rather, what they will probably do, the defender of the Sujigiri, is they will probably say, uh, you don't understand the practice well enough. You don't understand that in Japanese society, for instance, in the 1600s, it was a great honor to be killed by this sujigiri and that citizens volunteered for it because they wanted to help the war effort and um so what what's happened there i mean that kind of argument what's happened is the person who's defending the sujigiri is giving reasons as to why the practice is not as bad as it seems to the person who is criticizing it but notice that by doing that by arguing that the practice actually does make sense and that it is reasonable this person is giving up, the defender of the Sujigiri is giving up on moral isolationism. They're, they're not taking the line that 
Midgley can't possibly understand the practice. In fact, they're assuming Midgley can understand the practice because they're trying to explain it to her. They're trying to give the justification for it. In other words, they're trying to help her to not have such a crude judgment about it, but they do want her to have a judgment about it. They want her to have a positive judgment rather than a negative one. So the point there, again, is just that this way of um, responding that's probably more common and makes more sense when you're talking about some culture's practice that you're evaluating the goods and bads of, okay, is that this uh, way of doing it is not moral isolationist, but is actually assuming that it's possible to know enough about a practice to be able to form a reasonable judgment about whether it's good or bad, preferable or non-preferable. Well, that brings me to the end of my lectures on this essay. And now I'm just going to leave you with a few questions, which um, there will be questions similar to this that you can answer in both the reading response and also in the discussion thread post for this week, the, the discussion thread that will be opened up that you can post to. Okay, so one is, do you agree with Midgley's position and her arguments for it? So far, I've just been arguing for Midgley's position, but now we can stop and say, okay, well, are we convinced? Has Have her arguments convinced us or not? Or do we disagree with her? Okay. And if we disagree with her, why? We need to say, you know, why we're not convinced by one argument or another. Um, secondly, is there anything that you think Midgley might be missing? Okay. So as I think I mentioned at the end of the last set of slides, there are at least three positions that you can take here after reading Midgley's essay. You can say, uh, Midgley is right. Moral isolationism is a bad position to adopt. We ought to just give up on it. Um, the second option is to say Midgley is wrong. Her arguments are not convincing and moral isolationism is a good position for us to adopt. Or thirdly, you can say, well, I agree with Midgley that moral isolationism is wrong, but I think there's something wrong about the way that she's made her case against it. And I would like to uh, somehow refine that or modify that or add some new observations that we also need to take into consideration when we deal with this issue of when is it okay and under what circumstances and in what ways is it okay or not okay to uh, pass judgment on practices in cultures other than our own. So I leave you with those difficult and uh, interesting questions and we'll see each other in the next set of slides and hopefully have some discussion on the discussion boards.